All episodes are written and recorded by Ash Wolf, and content warnings can be found in the description. And a special thank you to my neighborhood cryptid for providing the voice of Dove in this episode. Kelphis knew better than to fight back when the sharp prod bit into her side. Even if she'd wanted to, the quick tug on the yoke fastened around her neck would have prevented it. The Minotaur stumbled forward, which only served to send the prod scraping under her ribs. She could feel blood spilling over, warm and wet, as it seeped into the dirty dress that had once been a soft blue. She tried not to think about the color it was now, how it was stained with mud, blood, and things she didn't want to remember. She fell in step behind the human. Kelphis tried to keep her pace even, but the dark behind her wasn't thrilled with the speed of his compatriot. She was, of course, the one who felt the annoyance, the side of the prod slamming against her ribs just as she was stepping forward. With her center of gravity already shifted, the blow was enough to send her into the thicket off to the side. Thorns stuck in her arms, scraping as she tried to catch herself. It was all in vain as the chain of the yoke pulled taunt, dragging her face through the bramble. Her eyes watered as pain pricked along every inch of her body. She wanted to lay there, every movement stung, dragging thorns through her skin, blood beating at the edges of uneven cuts. She knew getting up would hurt. She'd have to get her hands under her, put weight on the thorns to pull herself out of them. It wasn't something she was looking forward to, but the boot connecting with her shin told her that she'd waited long enough. With a snort, she pushed herself out of the clinging, twisted growth. Thorns dug into her hands though they hurt more when she pulled away. The savage, woody fangs clung to her skin, some refusing to let go. The ones that released caused more damage on the way out. A small part of her, the part that fell quieter with each passing day, considered fighting back. She could push her horns through the nearest one of them and run. She wouldn't get far, but the thought of one of her captors screaming in pain, clinging to a hole in their abdomen left her feeling a bit more powerful a power that immediately fled when she was unceremoniously yanked toward the larger group. They were visible through the trees now, gathered around an Avisala with a dusty pink face that faded into gray near the shoulders. Their head had dropped to their chest, the stone-colored beak brushing against a thin travel shirt. Their arms were already secured behind their back with thick iron bracers stretching from wrist to elbow. Their ankles were hobbled together, ensuring even if they did wake enough to escape, they weren't getting far. Her fluffy ears twitched as she picked up on the creature's breathing. She hated that she could recognize the pattern almost instantly. It was the not quite ragged, but not quite deep enough to be a proper sleep that indicated a sedative. She tried not to show interest as the group took everything they deemed valuable from the poor creature. Normally, she wouldn't even care. It wasn't like she knew where that stuff was kept. Even if she did, she'd never be able to reach it. What drew her attention to it in the first place was how frantically Jason was going through the interior pockets of the cloak. Despite the many things that tumbled out, most of which looked like small keepsakes, nothing seemed to be what he was looking for. He tore through the light jacket next. After another moment of annoyed searching, a grin split his features. The minute her shuffled to the side, it was as much as she could do without being punished. She hated that look. It sent her blood running cold, had her freezing in place, made her feel utterly powerless. Jason pulled away a long leaf about the size of his hand. It held the colors of the setting sun cascading through a never-ending darkness, pinks, purples, and blues glowing as they danced with each other, and lights twinkled to a silent melody. She'd never seen anything like it, but there was something familiar about it. Maybe she'd heard it talked about between the adults of the herd, or maybe it was from a story told around the fire after a day of travel when she couldn't keep herself from dozing off. As much as she wanted to figure out exactly why the leaf felt so familiar, she didn't have time to dwell. At the moment, chasing the puzzle around her mind did little to ensure her survival. Despite that, she did allow herself a moment to connect the few dots. The leaf probably had something to do with why the Avisala had been taken without injury. It was odd for the Dirks to refuse to harm something during its capture, but not unheard of. There have been times where creatures would be deemed too important. It was an order safe for those they wanted information out of or those who fetched a higher price when they were whole and alive, rather than in pieces. Kalfas had been trapped long enough to know most Avisala didn't fall into that category. Dirks made more money off the parts than the whole, and they weren't typically this gentle with one. All of that to say this one was important. 
if she could figure out why, she might be able to use it to her advantage. The sharp crack of the flat U-shaped prod echoed through the trees as the thick iron connected with her cheek. It rattled her teeth and sent white spots swirling in her vision. They sparked and twinkled with the anger of a thousand stars too close to her eyes. A headache was already pounding along her temples as she pulled the unconscious creature into her arms. Maybe it was the change in position, or the suddenness of the change to begin with. The Avisala's breathing stuttered. For a moment, Kelphis swore those fluttering eyes were going to open as she was going to learn just how much damage that beak was capable of. She watched with a thundering heart as she pushed herself to her feet. Please don't wake up. Her voice a low rumble and heard by the humans around them. She hoped the Avisala could hear her. That just this once, something wouldn't turn their anger to her because it tried to run. They relaxed back into her arms. She'd never known if it hurt her or was still too influenced by the Naga venom flooding its system. Not that the why mattered. As long as she wasn't going to get hurt because this thing wanted to fight the last moment of peace it was going to have for a while, she didn't care. The trees were growing thicker, the sun casting mottled light over the packed earth road they were following. The sounds of people talking and children's peeling laughter hovered at the edge of her range of hearing. They were getting close to the stronghold. The Avisala shifted and their breathing stuttered. She could feel their fingers flexing, testing the iron locking their forearms together. They tried kicking, probably attempting to undo the hobble. The movements were small, and it was clear the Avisala had no interest in attacking her specifically. Everything held strong. They weren't getting away. They were just as stuck as Kelphis was. Something swirled in her chest. If she were younger, or the situation less complicated, she would have called it joy. She wasn't going to get hurt because this creature chose to make both of their lives a living hell. The Avisala was smarter. Or maybe they were just more aware of their current predicament than the others had been. If the Avisala had gotten away, she would have been the one to take that punishment. Instead, they were quick to go limp, steadying their breathing as if they were hoping no one had noticed. It was entirely possible no one had. The Dirks were more focused on Jason, slapping the man on the back and congratulating him. Must have been rough, Kelphus overheard one of them say. Avisala are known to be stingy. Can't imagine being stuck with one for three years. Jason seemed genuinely confused, looking to the apothecary with a frown. Everyone knows Avisala don't have the means to reproduce. I can't imagine what it would have been like to go that long without getting some. Alex, Jason at least had the decency to look disgusted and sound annoyed. His fists were clenched to his sides as he put his entire focus to the path ahead. I'm going to need you to knock it off with that straight people nonsense. Despite what you clearly believe, Dove had at least that going for them. If you must know, they had the caring, feather-light touch of a gentle lover. Jason glanced back at the unconscious Avisala. Dove was large, easily seven feet tall, but they looked small in the Minotaur's arms. If he was being honest with himself, it was one of the only things he was going to miss. The nights where he tugged on the Avisala's feathers, begging for more. Ugh, Dove. Gross! I don't need to know this! The court is giving you all the information pertaining to the situation. As keeper to the Umber Court, you have to determine what information is pertinent to the story as you're telling it. As keeper to the Umber Court. <laughs> it takes time, but you'll get there. <sighs> now I gotta... Where do I even pick up after that? <sighs> <laughs> Dove wasn't going anywhere. Their arms were locked together with a short chain in the center secured where the wall met the floor. No matter how they pulled and tugged at the chains, nothing budged. Though whether that was because Dove simply wasn't strong enough or because no matter how they tried, they couldn't get a good angle, was anyone's guess. The dim light was barely enough to see by, but they didn't need it to know they weren't alone. They could hear at least one other creature. Their chains rattled and the metal links dragged against each other as it moved. A large shape draped in shadow shifted into view. The long horns curving into the air above her head were the first things that drew their attention. They were a deep brown, almost black at the ends, fading into a creamy white at the base. A white fur encircled her eyes, giving the already deep browns a black hole appearance. The soft, creamy fur on the inside of her ears caught the light as they twitched. A thick wind yoke settled along her neck and shoulders with a thick chain ensuring she couldn't stray more than a few feet from the wall. They could even see the rust of blood matted in her short hair. The Minotaur gave them a gentle smile, reaching a hand toward them. 
She didn't have cuffs securing her, but Dove could see the raised end of them on her wrist. The cord buzzed in the back of her mind, pressing as it tried to offer up information. It was too far away. When Dove reached for it, the cord seemed to retreat, as if it wanted nothing to do with a runaway key, and Dove couldn't blame it. They were surprised it even pretended to want something to do with them. They'd been given one job. Sit in the library, stay put, and they'd failed. The first time had been bad enough, hidden away in the middle of nowhere with only the court for company. Now, now they were getting what they deserved. They hadn't learned the first time, so the universe had taken it upon itself to impart wisdom. When the universe imparted wisdom, it was far less lenient than a friend or a disgruntled family member. It was downright cool. I'm Kelphis. When there was no response, she softened her tone and added, We can talk if we're quiet. She looked them over with interest. It was clear her earlier suspicions had been true. The Avisala hadn't been injured upon order and capture. She had come away from the hunt more injured than they had. It wasn't fair. The Derricks had been after the Avisala. They already had her. She was just another tool in their little hunt. Why keep knocking her down? Kelphus fought down the flash of anger stemming from the thought. She knew why. She also knew it wasn't the Avisala's fault. They were in the same position she was. Getting angry at them could quickly come back to bite her. She needed all the allies she could get in this place. If they were too important to kill, then maybe they could both use that to their advantage. All she had to do was figure out why they wanted the Avisala alive. She was still alive because they could use her as a beast of burden. With such limited access to her magic, she wasn't strong enough to escape on her own. Spending a majority of her life honing her mind rather than her body, also meant she wasn't able to brute force her way to freedom. So she had been forced to keep her head down and do things she wasn't proud of just to stay alive, in the hopes of one day returning to her family. It was clear the avian hidden in shadows wasn't keen on paying her any more than a glare. They were tall, probably a few inches shorter than herself. The way they were secured made it impossible for them to stand. The shortened chain meant they were never allowed anything more than a kneeling position. It's just us right now. There had been another not too long ago, though time was getting increasingly more difficult to tell the longer she was trapped. The Derricks had finished stripping the basilisk of everything useful to them. She shuddered as the memory surfaced, unbidden, the screeching, gargled cries still trying to claw their way to the forefront of her thoughts. There was another long pause as she waited for them to speak. Again, there was nothing, though this time the Avisala looked at her a little less suspiciously. They lowered their head, soft red-brown eyes closing as they sighed. Just when she thought she might get something out of them, the door flew open. Both of them flinched when solid metal slammed against the wall. Kalfas tucked her head in her arm, a futile attempt to keep the sudden blast of sunlight from blinding her. She pressed herself against the wall, yoke digging into the back of her neck. It was a coward's stance. She knew she looked like a child hiding from the raised voices of adults. But if it kept her alive, so be it. The Avisala was no different than anyone else they chained beside her. Their head snapped up at the sudden brightness, and they held it tall even as Jason approached, boots clicking on the stone floor. Kelvis had been here long enough to know better than to play those games. She pushed herself further into the darkness. The chain clanked, but neither bothered to look in her direction. Jason believed she was afraid of him. To say she wasn't would be a blatant lie. The Derricks carried weapons not to protect themselves, but to do harm to those they saw as beneath them. More than once, she'd found herself bound to the stage in the center of the stronghold. Left there for days while every Derrick in the vicinity got the chance to leave their mark. The scars that had her fur growing at odd angles were as numerous as the faces that left them. Jason took the most joy in it. He was the one who left the jagged scars that had taken weeks to heal. He was the one who laughed as the molten iron mixture settled under her skin. He was the one who would toy with the more aggressive prisoners, giving them ways to escape, only to capture them before they left the compound and use them as warning. While Jason terrified her, in times like this, she used his expectation of fear to her advantage. She crouched in the corner, purposely keeping her eyes down. It kept suspicion off her, allowed her to learn. 
It was only because of that she had an idea of where they were. She knew what the nearest town was called. Whether anyone there would be sympathetic to her cause, she couldn't say for certain. But the Dureks muttered the name with disdain, so she was hoping for the best. Jason held the Avisala's beak closed. Even the thrashing of their head wasn't enough to loosen their grip. After another useless escape attempt, the Avisala stopped, going stiff and rigid. For his part, Jason smiled, thumb gently running over the Avisala's right eye. I imagine you're having a bit of trouble connecting to the court right now. He patted Dove's cheek as though they were a child. It'll wear off in a few hours. Then you're going to tell me exactly what I want to know. Dove's eyes narrowed. There was a moment where they seemed to accept their fate. Their eyes cast down, focused on the hand tightly around their beak as their shoulders fell. They'd stopped pretending to be strong let the reality of their situation claim them. A grin flashed across Jason's face, and that was all it took, a split second of overconfidence, for that grip to loosen. Dove reared their head back, shaking the hand from their beak. Kelpus knew what would happen a moment before the scene unfolded. The Avicella's beak snapped around Jason's finger. The sickening crunch of bone filled the small room. Kelpus flinched away at the far too familiar sound but she couldn't find it in herself to feel sorry. It was about time Jason got even a hint of what he deserved. She watched the Avisala raise their head, stubbornness and a hint of pride filling those dark eyes. They spit a mouth full of blood on Jason's polished boots. I am not afraid of you. You should be. The words were calm despite the blazing hatred in the man's eyes. I'm the one who determines the severity of your punishments for not cooperating. You won't get the information you need if you kill me. I wonder how many body parts I'd have to take before you start talking. Maybe it was the casual tone, or the fact the man was cradling his injured hand to his chest, clearly pissed, but he hadn't yet retaliated. Maybe it was the way the still distant court was trying to snake its way into their thoughts. Something had Dove doing a double take. They'd clearly misread the situation. They'd known it was bad. That didn't escape them. But they thought they'd at least had some bargaining chip. Even just a claw sells for good money, Jason explained. And you've got eight to spare. Jason turned to leave, stopping in his tracks before he reached the door. I don't want to kill you. You're valuable. But if you don't give us the information we want, you are more valuable sold piece by piece. Keep that in mind the next time you open your mouth, Dove. Alone, the word court and the name Dove meant nothing to Kelphus. They were just a word and a name. But that's why Jason had been after the leaf. Why she'd felt a twinge of recognition despite never having seen something like that before. The puzzle was fitting together to paint a picture she didn't like the repercussions of. Dove was the keeper of the Ember Court. The Avisala with blood dripping down their beak was one of the most powerful creatures in the world. Not only was the Keeper important to the maintenance of the Umber Court, but to her family and others like it. She'd grown up traveling from place to place. Her family often labeled themselves as nomads by choice. They had always enjoyed exploring and learning about the world. It meant bulky items that weren't necessities were difficult to keep. Books often found themselves falling into that category. They were heavy, difficult to carry long distances, and easily destroyed by the elements. Her family relied heavily on the Umber Court to keep the records of their ancestors. They each carried one journal, that when Philip would be burned and replaced. Otherwise, they would write on anything they could find. In the dirt, sand, snow, mud, the medium didn't matter. The court would hold it for them so they could travel unburdened by the heavy load of books. If the keeper to the Umber Court was here, the world was cut off from the court. No one could get information unless they had Dove. Dove, who was currently being held in a Durek stronghold. Do you know what they want from you? Kelfas asked, moving to a more comfortable position. Dove shook their head, staring at the ground. It was a look Kelphus would later come to associate with Dove trying to make a plan. At that moment, they looked pissed, their beak twisting up into a grimace and eyes narrowed. 
Hisses and clicks escaped them like a boiling kettle. I just need to get the leaf back, Dove said, looking at Kelphis with a renewed hope. That's our ticket out of here. I can get us both to the court, and then we'll be safe. Are? Kelphis asked. Do you want to stay here? Dove asked, raising an eyebrow. I'm surprised. Not complaining. Dove lowered their head, shutting their eyes as though that would keep the screaming of the court from giving them a headache. They took one steady breath, breathing in for six seconds, holding it for seven, breathing out for eight. Five things you can see. They heard Ignan's gentle voice guiding them. The darkness isn't helping. Dove spat at the court's imitation of their teacher. <sighs> Kelpus. Chains. Dirt. Stone. The door. Four things you can touch. Honestly, not much. Dove took in another slow breath before shaking their head. The court was quieter now, placated that it had reestablished its connection. It wasn't perfect. The connection still felt too distant, but it would have to do. Pulling information was proving to be more difficult than they would have liked, but after a minute or so, they were able to grab what they needed. Your father is worried about you. Dove's voice felt like a gunshot in the silence. He has been writing to anyone he can think of for help locating you. The Derek's right little down. I'm afraid I wasn't much help to him before, but I can fix that. Kelphus didn't have the words to describe the twisting in her gut. It was a mixture of guilt, love, hope, fear, and a sadness that fell over her like the cold darkness after the last warm rays of light were driven from the sky. Her family had never given up on her. Even after she'd long accepted they were gone, if not gone, they weren't looking for her. Why would they? She was the reason they'd been found in the first place. The rest of my family, oh, are they? And they're alive, Dove assured her. They all miss you. One of your sisters, she blames herself. She's afraid you hate her. Kelphus lowered her head. Of course Azalea would think that. Kelphus wasn't about to admit to a total stranger that she had. For far longer than she would have liked. Azalea had only listened. If she'd stayed close like she'd been told, none of this would have happened. But she'd have been a child. She was still a child. I just couldn't blame her forever. Especially when it really wasn't her fault to begin with. I should have been keeping a better eye on her. Was the only explanation Kelphus offered.